that goes. Just a minute. Okay, good. Uh, today, uh, we welcome as our IR lab seminar speaker, Professor Pat Langley. Um, first, I'll do the basic introduction, which is that he serves as the director for the Institute for the Study of Learning and Expertise, and as a research scientist at Stanford University's Center for Design Research. Uh, he has contributed to artificial intelligence and cognitive science for more than 40 years. And in some sense, uh, the, the talk itself is uh, some part of Pat's journey uh, uh, during his research career. And he has published many books and uh, papers. And I believe I'm right, uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong, that he did write the first graduate level book on machine learning. Uh, he has developed a, a computational approaches, some of the first ones for scientific knowledge discovery and an early champion for experimental studies of machine learning and its application to real world systems. He's the founding editor of two journals, um, one that might be very well known, that is the Machine Learning Journal in 1986, and the more recently, the Advances in Cognitive Systems. Uh, and he is also a fellow of both AAAI and the uh, Cognitive Science Society. Right. And his current research interests uh, include architectures for embodied agents, objective methods for plan understanding, and learning procedures from written instructions. Of course, um, having worked with FAT for at least for a few years, I know that his interests are really broad and he has many interesting directions and ideas going on. And I should probably say that I, I'm very pleased to have him here uh, to, our, to present in this seminar series. And uh, uh, I should also point out uh, the, that the papers that are included as part of the abstract are really interesting papers to um, um, read. And if you have time, please go ahead and read them. But let's go ahead directly to Pat Langley's talk. Pat, go ahead. Thanks, Mohan. Um, well, thank you all for uh, getting up early and, and coming to hear this talk. Um, uh, I've given this a couple of times before. It's getting a little more polished. Um, but I hope you find it interesting. So what is machine learning? Uh, it, in my view, it's, it's an example of what Herb Simon called a science of the artificial. Uh, that is, it designs and constructs artifacts. It examines the behaviors of those artifacts. It also attempts to understand and explain their behavior. And based on that, it tries to formulate principles to aid in the design of future artifacts of the same type. And in this particular case, we're talking about computational artifacts that improve their performance based on experience. Hold on. Can you guys still see this? Pat, we see a slide called Elements of Learning Systems with a That's block fine. Yeah. yeah. Zoom is getting in my way. All right, great. Uh, good. So, uh, so this is a diagram that's taken, it's about 40 years old. I didn't draw the first version of it. I don't know who did. Um, but it shows the, the elements of, of a learning system, uh, including the environment or the source of, of experience for the, uh, the system. Um, uh, of course, as a learning mechanism, but the, the output of the learning mechanism is, is some kind of expertise. Uh, back in the old days, we would call it knowledge, but, uh, but uh, perhaps that would not be a, a generic enough term now. Um, that knowledge or expertise is used by a performance element, which interacts with the environment uh, to produce behavior. Um, and so it, it so you could always take away the learning and you would still have the knowledge, the environment and the performance system and learning is there to try to improve performance, okay? Um, the point of this diagram is you can never talk about learning in isolation. You also, you always have to talk about the environmental input, the expertise and how you represent it and the performance element that uses it. And this is all sometimes forgotten because People tend to work in one paradigm. They, they assume that everyone knows what these other assumptions are, but they really are crucial. Now, we launched machine learning as a sort of self-conscious, self-defined field in 1980. There was a workshop at Carnegie Mellon uh, that summer. Um, and it, we, at the time, viewed it as a subfield of artificial intelligence that was focused on the acquisition of expertise. It's not that there wasn't work that we would now call machine learning before then. It was that we didn't think of it as a field. 
uh, it was generally viewed as part of AI, just uh, just AI. And and now we had people who were who were who were saying, no, this is this is what I do. Um, but it was still part of AI. Uh, within ten years, I would say many researchers in the area had, had stopped, almost stopped to view themselves as AI researchers. Certainly, um, some of the students we had at University of California, Irvine. Uh, were not getting broad training in AI. They were specialists in, in machine learning, and, and that has that trend has continued unabated, I would say. Um, it's even worse now because there are people who believe that machine learning is the only possible way you could you could build intelligent systems. Um, uh, and I don't think either of those views, that machine learning is a standalone field or that it's the only viable path to intelligent uh, programs. Neither of those is 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 a very constructive because they don't acknowledge again this this important point that representation and performance are really essential. And so you need to there are other parts of AI that focus on those, and we need to understand those as well to do a good job. Now, over the years, if you look at the literature of machine learning, you'll see that different researchers have adopted different metaphors. Um, when I say metaphor, I just mean a sort of general, a general high-level view or story about what's going on. Some of the earliest, um, for example, going back to Patrick Winston's thesis in 1970, was the idea that learning is is some kind of structural generalization or analogical mapping. Um, another was that it was a kind of knowledge acquisition that happened very monotonically over time. A third was that it was the results of multi-step reasoning that, uh, that then got cached, generalized and cached in, in memory. A fourth, one that I was excited about in the late 80s, uh, was, was it was a kind of incremental hill climbing through a space of models. Um, a, a variation on that, but one that has become more widely adopted is, is, is that, that learning is searched through a space of model structures. Um, and I'm not gonna talk a, a lot, um, uh, well, so that, that's that's one that has uh, become very very widely adopted. Another more recent one is that machine learning is uh, is all is all about parameter estimation and optimis and optimization of those parameters. Um, so these are again different metaphors, different ways of thinking about learning. They're not right. They're not wrong. They're not even mutually exclusive, but they do offer different perspectives. And one of the problems is that. Uh, over the past few decades, the last two metaphors have come to dominate the field at the other's expense, so that you don't really hear people talking about the others anymore. Um, we will revisit some of those ideas later in the talk um, toward the end, but, uh, but, but as, you, as I go through the history, you'll, you begin to see how this happened. Now, let me turn to some myths that have grown up around those two dominant metaphors, um, they sort of have accreted sort of like barnacles. Um, and I don't think that they had to. They're not, they're, they're common, they do reflect common practice in the field, but they're really not essential for doing machine learning. Uh, but they become so widely adopted that there's very few people now who would even consider questioning them, right? It's like a fish saying, well, could I be somewhere other than in water? Uh, well, yeah, maybe you could fly, but no, they're not going to think about that because that's all they know. Um, and uh, I would argue that this is kind of, this kind of sort of lemming-like behavior has nearly extinguished the intellectual diversity that we originally had in the field. I think that's a real, um, it's, it's really unfortunate. And I think that uh, there are many more avenues to studying uh, computational learning than are currently being explored now. Despite all the energy, all the effort, all the excitement about it, uh, I would claim that the field has become remarkably narrow in terms of the approaches it explores. So here are some, here are four myths. The first is that expertise is opaque compiled experience. Um, this is not often stated explicitly, but it's very widespread. It's that learning is all about compiling experience down into expertise, and the expertise is, is really opaque. Um, and this is really an analogy with compilation in, in computer science, right? So 
Um, you have a program, you compile it, so it gets a small footprint, it runs really fast, you don't have to think about it anymore. And in the process, compilation produces these arcane binary files that, that, that none, not very few people, and certainly not mere mortals like, like us, could ever hope to understand. And that's okay, because all you're gonna do is run it. Um, but of course, human learning, although it also transforms experience into expertise, doesn't always do this. Uh, there are cases where human learning seems to produce some kind of compiled code, but often it's not. Often we can communicate the results. We acquire concepts. We learn constraints um, that we can pass on to others. And so this idea that learned expertise must necessarily be opaque and it's necessarily be compiled experience, that's just a, that's just a popular myth. I, it, and I, it, again, I can give you plenty of examples counter, uh, where that does not have to be true, uh, although I'm uh, not going to spend much time on them here. I hope you'll trust me. Um, just look at some of my papers if you want to see examples. Uh, another um, somewhat less common is that learning is a batch process that happens offline. That is, you got all the training cases uh, available in the outset of learning. And as a result, you, can, you, have, you have all the data so you can calculate statistics and that those can guide the learning process. You can certainly do that. People, a, a machine learning systems do that all the time, but it's not the only game in town. If you look at human learning, it's online, it's incremental, and yet somehow it's remarkably effective. Um, so this is another false assumption and one that has, re, I would say, reduced exploration through the space of possible learning methods. Third is that learning is guided only by data. As the, the data, the training cases are the sole source of information that you that can or or even should guide learning. Um, again, this isn't universally adopted, but it's pretty widespread. Partly, I think this was a backlash because uh, uh, early expert systems back in the 70s and 80s, um, you had to add knowledge manually, you had to debug them, and so on. And and so there was, and you could introduce errors that way. It was very expensive. So if we could do it all with data. That would be fantastic. Um, another was uh, in the mid '90s. Uh, this branch movement called data mining uh, came out, and that was really all about the the emphasis, of the value of data, and trying to get extract as much as you could from the data. Again, there's there's nothing inherently wrong with this. You can you can certainly build machine learning systems that learn only from the data. But if you look at how people work. They never learn from scratch, okay? They're always acquiring new knowledge in the context of structures they already have. So this is another myth, and I would claim it's misdirected research in the field for decades. Fourth is that if you're gonna have effective learning, you need big data, lots of data, more data than you can imagine, right? Um, massive training sets and powerful computers to process them. Um, now this is closely tied to the idea that learning should be driven by the data alone. Of course, if that's all you have, then maybe you need more data, but even then you don't need as much as uh, has often claimed, um, but it's more than that. I think that this is related to what I would call a data fetish that has actually been promoted by certain companies whose business models benefit from it. Of course, if you've got a company that that owns a lot of data, has collected a lot of data, and, and other companies don't, then it's in your best interest to champion big data solutions because then other companies can't compete with you. It would not be wise for them to say, oh yeah, you know, you could do the same thing with what, one thousandth of the data. That wouldn't be a very smart move for them. Uh, but really, there are many cases, many settings where, first of all, you don't have big data. And second, you don't need big data. You can a little bit of data can go a long way, and the processing of the, those those cases is really not that expensive. Again, this is just a myth. It's warped the tasks and the methods that the community on which the community is focused. And and again, it's not that you can't do it; it's that it's not the only way to do it. And it's uh, it's I think truly misguided for us to for us to be this to be the only thing that we're doing. Now, yes, I know that there are some examples of recent work. 
um, in the deep learning community trying to get beyond uh, these things. They are certainly not uh, dominant. They are not the, the main way people do things. Um, but, uh, but that's not, but, but there is plenty of other work that violates these assumptions that if you have to look farther back in the history of the field. And that's where I'm gonna go now is how did we get here? Well, machine learning has been around for over 40 years now. Um, but it goes farther back than that, as I said. Uh, so, so if you look at the early days of AI, like the late 50s through the 60s, uh, AI, artificial intelligence and a, another field called pattern recognition were really closely linked. Um, but by 1970, they had pretty much um, broken apart and there was not much communication going on. Uh, by 1970, this field called pattern recognition with its own journal and its own conference, that focused on perceptual tasks like classifying objects and images or recognizing words and speech. Most of that uh, work used numeric encodings of, the, of the, the training and test cases, and it relied on statistical learning to induce classifiers. In contrast, AI was all about higher level cognitive tasks like reasoning and planning and language understanding. <clears throat> I don't mean text retrieval or text classification, I mean language understanding. And most of the work adopted symbolic notations. And in fact, learning played a really minor role. And that separation of objectives and representations and approaches continued unabated until about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when you started to see the, the renewed interest in, in neural networks and, and what is now called AI looks remarkably like what we used to call pattern recognition. Uh, but that's a, we'll, we'll get there in a bit. Now, what was going on here? Well, why didn't AI researchers like learning? Well, it was partly because of the connections to cognitive psychology. Those were two fields that grew up together. Uh, cognosology, cognitive psychology really uh, became, they had major breakthroughs at, and on the same time as AI in the late 50s because, and, and it wasn't an accident, uh, it was because cognitive psychology adopted the computational metaphor and that there were active researchers who were doing both at the same time. In fact, two of the field's founders, um, Alan Newell and Herb Simon, saw themselves as computational psychologists. And the cognitive revolution in the 50s was, in many ways, was a, a rebellion, a revolution against behaviorism. Behaviorism was the dominant paradigm in American psychology, at least for decades. It focused on learning in sensory motor tasks. In fact, behaviorist psycho psychologists like B.F. Skinner would argue that, oh yeah, it's, it's just a, it's, it's, there's nothing going on inside the head. It's just uh, learning stimulus response pairs. Uh, no cognition. Cognition was a, an artifact. It was just an illusion. So the cognitive psychologists and AI researchers of the 50s said, no, no, what's, this, what's really interesting is what's going on inside the head. Um, and it's about what distinguished people from, say, rats and pigeons, the kind of subjects that the behaviorists use. Um, there was certainly some work on learning in AI and in psychology, but it was a relatively minor role in both of those fields. But by the late 70s, there'd been a lot of progress in AI. There had been this, uh, this great breakthroughs in expert systems and early applications in, in that area. But by the late 70s, there were researchers in AI who were beginning to say, well, you know, we've, it's really time to look at learning again based on what we've, we've learned in other areas. Uh, so, so in the 70s, you see growing amounts of work on what was then called concept attainment, called supervised concept learning, grammar acquisition, uh, learning strategies for problem solving. And that those early results led to a series of workshops in 1980, 83, 85, and 87, and books that came out of them. And there were three researchers who were behind all this, Richard Mikulski, Jaime Carbonell, and Tom Mitchell, um, they were the organizers and they decided to call this field machine learning. Uh, the term may have been floating around before, but that they 
that then they it that became sort of coined and and began widely used. There was a a book they published in '83 called Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Approach, saying that these were sort of joined at the hip. That machine learning was about from an AI perspective. Now at the time, this was sort of viewed as a fringe element. Okay. Uh, it was not a big community, uh, but it was on the map. Now, why did we do this? I was, uh, I had just finished my thesis. I was, I was uh, in and around the movement, but, uh, but still pretty junior. Um, well, one of them was this, this uh, reaction against expert systems. It wasn't that any of us disliked expert systems. Uh, we found them, it was, the idea was fine. It was like, okay, if you're going to, to have a, a, a system that does domain specific task, you need knowledge. So you got to get the knowledge in there somehow. People had been building that by hand, but we thought, gee, why don't we automate the, the construction of that knowledge base? But I would say that about a quarter of the early machine learning researchers were coming from psychology. My PhD was in psychology. I, it, um, uh, John Anderson was, was, was very well known and respected in, in the area um, and others. And and we, some of us wanted to use computational methods to understand the processes behind human learning. And that was part of the movement. There were other political things. We were having trouble getting our papers published because the established AI community didn't really think the kind of stuff we were doing was um, interesting or appropriate or whatever. We, it, you know, plus, there, some of us were young Turks. We wanted to to get our our name up in lights, and and so I mean I certainly remember feeling like that was a a path for me, and I'm sure other junior people felt that way too. Um, there were different aims for different different members of the community, but there was lots of overlap, and again mutual respect among different uh, approaches. Now, of course, we needed a place to publish. Uh, there was this journal, Artificial Intelligence. Um, there were meetings like Ichikai and AAAI. AAAI was just started in 1980. We did not feel they were very supportive of what we were doing. Uh, and so the obvious thing was to launch a new journal. Of course, we called it Machine Learning. Uh, and, and I volunteered to serve as the executive editor and Mikulski, Carbonell, and, and Mitchell signed on as editors. Actually, I was gonna be editor and they were gonna be associate editors, but, but the senior person uh, didn't like that idea, so we in made our title sound a little more uh, uh, impressive. Um, so with the first volume of the journal, uh, it was published by Kluwer Academic Press, um, and uh, it appeared in 1986. There wasn't a lot, of a, a lot of excitement about it from outside the community, uh, except for maybe the color. The color of the, if you've seen the journal, it's sort of a pea green uh, that no one liked, and don't blame me. Now, early work in machine learning and AI more generally, um, if you looked at those papers, you often find they, they took a sort of systems approach to things. What do I mean by that? Well, it was a, a bunch of, of, of it was a program, but it often had identifiable modules um, that interacted in interesting ways. And they would often give names to these, these programs, uh, almost like they were people. And, and I and I they didn't think they were people, but they there really was a sense in which it was a systems uh, kind of of community. But as the field progressed, I would say by the by the by 1990, early 90s for sure, um, people had shifted their attention to a focus on algorithms um, that focused on narrow, well-defined, sort of compartmentalized aspects of learning. Um, that could be specified clearly in 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 pithy pseudocode. Um, and they were modeled after formal work in computer science. Now it was still largely empirical work, but at that, again, youngsters youngsters don't know this, but but in the in the seventies and even early eighties, it wasn't if you did an AI thesis, it wasn't clear what kind of department you would end up in. Computer science didn't really accept AI in the early days, it, but by the late eighties, most people who were getting PhDs had grown up in computer science departments and they were exposed to formal analyses of algorithms and complexity theory and things like that. And so the idea that, oh, machine learning should be 
understanding that studying algorithms that was that was uh, that was uh, in the air at the time. In fact, I did a lot uh, since I was editing this journal. I did a lot to encourage the use of pseudocode as a way to communicate. So again, it wasn't wrong to study algorithms, but there was a shift uh, away from the system's uh, perspective, which I think lost some things. Now, machine learning did begin as an empirical discipline. Most researchers would build computer programs. They would run them, but back then they would typically run them on like, like 20 or 30 examples. And they wouldn't report the, the results. They would report what it learned, like a set of rules or something. And they would say, see, it learned, it learned the right thing or something reasonable. Um, gradually, and I mean, it, was, it took, took some years, we realized that we needed to do more than that. We needed to measure, remember the thing about hooking learning up to a performance system. We, need learning, we needed to show that learning improved performance. To our surprise, some of these systems actually uh, weren't doing very well, and pretty, but pretty quickly that changed. And, uh, and uh, there was some resistance about this. Um, the, by, the, uh, by the early 90s though, uh, experimental studies with performance measures had become the default. A part of that was that because we had a journal and, and conference reviewers who cared about that, that would, that would sort of push people to, to report uh, empirical results, sorry, performance results. But uh, there, there was more than that. Uh, I gained a reputation in the early days for, in the late 80s and early 90s for being a gadfly. If someone gave a talk at a conference and they would show, see, see look at the rules it learned, I would raise my hand and say, this is nice, but uh, how do you know if they're any good? How do you know if it improves performance? And for about a year or two, people just thought, they thought I was a pain in the behind. And then lo and behold, I didn't have to ask that question anymore because other people would. So there was peer pressure, public pressure. This did not, this was, did not come from DARPA or, or funding agencies. This was, was, I won't say it's grassroots because we definitely were, were ringleaders behind this, but, uh, but it was not a, it was a community kind of, uh, kind of thing. Now, the initial studies were about showing performance improvement. They weren't about comparing to other, uh, to other methods at all. Uh, but then, in the late 80s, David Aha, who was a grad student at UCI when I was there, um, he started to collect data sets, initially from other students there. Because back then, you had, to, you had to find your own data set to show that, that your learning system was, was worth it. Worth it. Um, so he said, well, I'll collect these. And he made them available by FTP, of course, because that's how you transferred files in the old days. Um, and, and of course, the, most of the stuff he collected was for, for supervised learning for classification tasks, because that was the most problem, common problem under study even back then. Um, and the initial collection was small. The data sets, there were many issues. I won't tell you about the mushroom data set uh, unless there's time later. But, uh, but it really had a profound effect because not only could researchers test their system on many domains uh, and thus show generality, but they could compare them to other methods. And that ability that really helped transform machine learning into, an, a, a, into a serious empirical discipline. Uh, but it did have some negative effects and I'll come back to those in a little bit. So, I think it's fair to say that uh, a, both AI and machine learning have always suffered from uh, some members of the community who took polemical or rhetorical stances that they had a questionable scientific merit. Um, in the 1980s, there was a debate. You saw this more in the cognitive science community than in, in AI, uh, but uh, this said, well, there's symbolic approaches to intelligence and there's connectionist approaches, neural nets. And they were really in, incomparable. They were relevant for entirely different settings. Um, and that was just an, un, an unquestioned assumption for quite a while until the UCI repository came along. And something really interesting happened in 1989. Uh, there were three papers in Ichikai that year. Um, uh, one of them was by Ray, Ray Mooney uh, and his colleagues, um, but there were two. There were others. Uh, they they did an experimental comparison between decision tree induction and neural network learning. 
uh, mostly backpropagation. And to people's amazement, they could run them on the same data sets and they got roughly comparable results. There were some domains in which one did better, some in which the other did better. It wasn't that one was always, always somehow magically better. Um, there were interesting variations going on. Um, and, but, but the surprise for some people was that you could even apply these to the same task. I mean, the rhetoric was that strong back then. Now it is true, uh, especially in these days that you can apply neural nets to images in ways that it's not obvious how you would do that with say decision trees. But, but, back th but there's nothing to keep you from running neural nets on the same attribute value representations as you give to, uh, to, uh, to decision tree learners or to rule induction systems or, or whatever, right? Um, and so some people were really shocked by this. I remember seeing people in the, in the hallways going, well, what, what, what do you mean they compared them? Uh, it was it was a conceptual breakthrough for some people that look these are all they work differently but they're doing the same task they're learning to classify cases in assign cases into into classes based on on regularities they found in the data now that again it's hard it's probably hard for you to imagine that 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 we were having trouble with this but but we did grapple with it and this really led to a redefinition of the field if you go back and look at the call for papers from the journal machine learning which i wrote and which i'm really embarrassed about uh it made it very clear that that it, the field was about learning rules and decision trees and grammars and other symbolic structures because it had grown out of symbolic ai and that's what it was about um, but now we saw, some of us saw, that didn't make a lot of sense, that we should really be including methods from pattern recognition from, and, and even, even neural networks, you know, which at the time was like, oh my God. Um, and so we said, no, we're going to redefine the field. We're going to say machine learning is a study of any computational methods that improve performance based on experience. There was resistance to this. Uh, but it seemed like this was, we had to do this, right? We had to open the door. Uh, we didn't think at the time it would become a floodgate, but, uh, but, uh, but, but we did this. And in fact, we went to explicit efforts to the community. So some of us in leadership positions said, now we got to do things to, to encourage neural net people to publish in, in machine learning circles because they're playing the same game, right? Uh, so we had special issues and uh, and other things. And I'd say by the uh, by the early '90s, the journal and the new conference we launched in '88, um, ICML, was publishing papers on not only on the learning of rules and decision trees and logical formulae, but also uh, case libraries and sort of nearest neighbor methods, multi-layer neural networks. Uh, there was beginning to be work on learning probabilistic models and even hybrid frameworks, so like multivariate decision trees that had sort of uh, perceptrons at internal nodes, or there was a, a really interesting system called Cobweb that Doug Fisher developed that combined ideas from decision trees, uh, nearest neighbor, and probabilistic classifiers. Now, every researcher had his or her favorite approach. That wasn't the point. The point was that there was mutual respect and, and there was, this was an increase in diversity that led us to <clears throat> a better understand what the space of possibilities were. <clears throat> now, again, if you go back to in the early literature, you'll see that there was, remember I said that there was this systems view on things. Part of that was people were working on more complex tasks like, uh, like uh, the Soren Prodigy architectures were really doing richer, richer, complex uh, problem solving things. But, but some of the work on just on classification learning was complex almost for its own sake, it seemed like in hindsight. There was one system that Mikulski developed called AQ, AQ various versions, um, that I remember trying to describe it when I wrote, when I was writing up uh, my textbook. And it was like, it went on and on because it had so many modules. Um, but as we, started running experiments with the UCI repository, we started to get some very surprising results. Things like in that 89 paper, Mooney and colleagues found that, that one layer perceptrons, or you know, 
single hyperplane split did remarkably well on some of the UCI uh, data sets. Rob Holty found that decision trees with only one test did very well in many cases. And, and I had a paper uh, in 92 showing that Naive Bayes did much better than we had been led to expect. Everyone thought it was, it was the dumbest method around because it made this crazy independence assumption, right? Uh, but in fact, that didn't matter too much in a lot of cases and it was remarkably effective. Um, and you still find it used in many applications today because it's so so uh, so efficient and uh, and uh, it doesn't have many parameters. So so these really were genuine insights, but they did encourage so they almost encouraged this focus on algorithms rather than the systems kind of thing, which I think was unfortunate. Another thing that that came out in the in the mid '90s was uh, that we got it got from. There was, we started to interact with uh, people from statistics. Partly that was because um, uh, Leo Bryman uh, uh, and Jerry Friedman and, and their colleagues had developed uh, techniques that were very similar to induced decision tree induction. They called them in, uh, classification trees and regression trees. Um, but the methods were very, very similar. And they knew all about this thing called the bias variance trade-off that said, originally it was developed for regression, not for classification, that said, oh, well, um, um, if you, any, any system that learns from data is going to have two sources of error. One of them is the bias that's uh, related to, to uh, uh, what it, how well it would do in the limit with infinite data. And that's what all, was often due to limited representational power. For example, naive Bayes just can't represent some things. But the other errors came from variance. That is, if you gave it slightly different training sets, then uh, you might get very different uh, learned models. And, and that, that, when you came to generalization time, would, would be a source of error. Um, and generally, there's a trade-off between these. And, uh, and so some methods, like naive Bayes, would and decision stumps, those would, would be high bias, low variance. <clears throat> Other methods like nearest neighbor and decision tree induction were the opposite. Uh, but more interestingly, people would actually decompose these and try and understand what was what was a source of, of error in their in their experiments. Another thing that happened uh, earlier than than most people can imagine um, was uh, was uh, fielded or deployed applications uh, that were built using machine learning. These were happening certainly by 85, 86. There were, there were systems in place in companies by the late 80s. And in 1993, Kodertoff and I um, organized a, a workshop where we had like 14 or so speakers, who each of whom had used machine learning to build some kind of a expert system or knowledge-based system um, that was actually being used in companies. Now, back then, it was less about making money through ads, uh, which wasn't a thing then, and more about uh, saving money uh, by uh, reducing manpower or, or increasing return on investment. So there were, but there were plenty of examples, uh, things like recommending decisions on credit card uh, requests, diagnosing motor pumps, classifying sky objects uh, in, in photos, uh, monitoring the quality of, uh, of uh, emulsions in manufacturing, uh, reducing uh, ink uh, bands in printing presses, and uh, predict, even predicting the recurrence of breast cancer. Um, <clears throat> again, these weren't just publications in the AI literature. These were systems that were being used in practice by 93. Okay, so if you're going, if you hear about how there's all these breakthroughs and now machine learning is finally leading to results. Sorry, guys, it's been around for a long time. There are more people working on it now. And so of course there's gonna be more successes, but there were plenty of successes back then. Herb Simon and I had a CACM article where we reviewed some of these successes. And, uh, and uh, we also, toward the end, analyzed what we thought was responsible for the successes. And, the, and I'll just give you a hint. It wasn't the particular induction method you used. It was everything else that the developer did to, to make it work. You could probably have taken that induction method and replaced it with something else and gotten good results too. 
Uh, this doesn't mean you shouldn't use what you know, but but again, this was consistent what we were learning about how different approaches were they worked differently, but they were basically going after the same problem and giving very often comparable results. Now, those early successes in applications were soon became linked to something called data mining. There were in the late 80s some small workshops on something called uh, knowledge discovery from very large databases. And I was trying to figure out why the organizers were obsessed with very large databases because it's like, why do you need very large databases to discover knowledge? You didn't. The, those early applications, many of them only had a few hundred examples. Some of them had a few thousand. It wasn't like a big deal, right? Why did you need lots of data? But the data mining people became excited about big data. Um, in fact, there was a, uh, I would say about 30% of that, that community in the early days came from the database crowd. It wasn't, and, and most of it, then maybe 60% from machine learning and, and then there were statistics and a few others. But uh, the data mining movement was, I would say almost obsessed with efficient processing of large training sets. Uh, again, I think this was partly the database influence. Uh, they did care a lot about having models that were interpretable, at least back then they did. So decision trees uh, were a popular representation for uh, learned knowledge, uh, but then BayesNets came along and they were cool too. Uh, opaque models were not considered just, uh, very acceptable. Um, there was, again, a lot of excitement about incorporating techniques from databases and statistics. Um, and there was a, the first conference on data mining, to my knowledge, took place in 1995. And there was a journal launched uh, shortly afterwards. I was not convinced that we needed it because there were plenty of successful applications in machine learning. Why didn't we just call it applied machine learning, but phenomena, things like that. So uh, there was a big difference. The data mining conference was filled with suits, right? I mean, they, you could tell that the people were from business. Machine learning com community, back then the conferences, uh, or you could tell they were academics. It's probably not true anymore, but I can't tell you because I haven't been for a while. Then there was the web, okay? Again, if some of you guys have grown up with this, uh, you were probably weaned on the web. And, and, uh, but, but in the early days, we had real trouble obtaining data. And once we had gotten, gotten results, delivering them to customers. We had to, had to overcome obstacles within companies to, to get the, this stuff and, and both get the data and to get the results out. I could tell you some, some funny stories about runarounds uh, people did. But when the World Wide Web came along, suddenly it was far easier to get data um, uh, and much easier to deliver uh, services, right? So you had search engines, you had online shopping sites, you had uh, other things that really changed the landscape. And recommender systems in particular had data collection and machine learning built into the very design from the beginning. Now, that was good in a lot of ways. Um, it led to plenty of more research, six, many more success stories. Um, but it also did encourage more work on learning from large data sets, large databases. And it really discouraged uh, work on, on data efficient methods. Um, and again, we'll come back to that later, but I think that there's, you, you begin to see pressures pushing the field in a certain direction. Um, and along with that came, as you got more data, you could do more with statistics, right? And by 2005, the field had really become enamored of statistical techniques that included uh, Bayesian estimation methods, kernel methods, Ensemble learning, uh, I mean, things like uh, like boosting and bagging and uh, uh, including random forests. Uh, and then you, you saw work on constrained optimization and even people who were concerned with logic like relational representations became caught up in that movement. So if you go to uh, meetings on statistical relational learning, uh, yes, they would produce outputs that looked like rules, but most of the work was about doing statistical analyses. Um, so this trend went back at least to the mid-90s, but now it really became a dominant theme. 
And if you didn't fit into that, if you were trying to learn, say, uh, new structures from very few training cases without statistics, good luck, right? You could publish, you just couldn't publish there. All right, so um, now I mentioned applications of machine learning were, had become successful um, even, even by the early 90s, but of course academics needed to have their own way to, to, to show they were making progress. And unfortunately, uh, I think that they, they naturally turned to experimental studies, but they did it in a, what I think is, was a really uh, unfortunate uh, way. They, many people started to carry out what, um, the, what I would call mindless bake-offs, um, where you would have basically, you'd, you'd, you'd compare uh, different algorithms on, on the same data sets, and you'd show that one was a little better than another, and you, you still see this going on a lot, right? Um, and it didn't matter if it was just a little better, right? As long as it was better, then you could get published. Um, there was also this tendency to that started with the UCI repository, but didn't stop there, of picking a fixed group of data sets and think, treating them as, quote, benchmarks, which I think was a terrible, terrible idea. Not, not that it was bad to test your system on many domains or data sets, but the idea that you pick a random set of, 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 of domains and, and run your system on that without understanding anything about them, except maybe how many training cases there were, that was not wise and it's still not wise. Um, the, uh, then there was the introduction of, of metrics, I would call obfuscating metrics, things like area under the RRC curve or the F1 metric, which almost seem intentionally designed to hide information. When you don't need to, you could just report the, the RRC curve or you could report precision and recall. And then of course, there were competitions. Uh, these did not initially happen in machine learning uh, until companies started to introduce them, uh, but they're pretty common these days. And uh, winners get prizes, and it's like, and, and, and how is that advancing science? I'm just not sure. So the problem with this is, of course, the reason why this is all bad is because they ignored this, uh, these great papers that Dennis Kibler and I wrote in the early days on how you should be doing uh, experimental studies in, in machine learning, and why? The reason was not to show that you've got the best thing to slice bread. It was to gain scientific insight into when machine learning is effective and when it's not, to understand the factors that influence success or failure. And that means benchmark domains isn't gonna cut it. You need to systematic, you do need controlled experiments to try that vary, for example, how much noise there is in the data, how many irrelevant variables there are, um, uh, how many, uh, how much class noise there is, how many <clears throat> um, uh, factors like that 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 you can't you, that just using natural data sets is not enough. You also need to complement this with with synthetic data. Not typically done these days, and it's never been typically done. <clears throat> okay. Well, let me let me sh let me jump ahead because there's a period of about ten years that I'm not going to be able to go over. Partly because I don't have time, and partly because that was around when I sort of dropped out of the field uh, for a while. And I'm, um, but nowadays, of course, uh, deep learning has taken over. Um, and if you don't know what deep learning is, just ask uh, ask the person sitting next to you. I'm sure they can. They can give you an earful. There have been some impressive results, for sure, um, in some in some areas, particularly in image processing, speech processing, and language uh, language um, uh, processing. Um, uh, but 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 uh, there have been some so those are sort of well known performance improvements over what was able what you could get before. Uh, some unexpected benefits are that uh, people have started to talk about systems again. <clears throat> they draw a systems diagram. They're not just talking about algorithms. And I think that's a good thing. There's a growing, because the methods for learning in, in deep neural networks require so much training data typically, there's a growing realization that despite what the data mining people said, we are not 
always drowning in data. There are many application areas where we it's very hard to get data. And I, I, I <clears throat> have heard students in, in the hallway talking about some problem they want to do and they go, oh, well, we don't have data on that. Oh, well, they're going to go off and spend six months constructing a data set so they can then train their system. And I find this hilarious because what it means is that Machine learning was supposed to help us overcome something called the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. And of course, now we've replaced that with something you might call the data acquisition bottleneck. Sometimes, like with images on the web, there's lots of data. Sometimes it's not labeled, sometimes it is, but sometimes you just don't have the data. And maybe we should be thinking about what to do there. And people are. Even people in deep learning are beginning to be concerned about this. Oh, and my favorite is there was 20 years when reinforcement learning, you couldn't get a paper published unless you had convergence proofs. In the limit, it had converged the optimal policy. Well, it's almost impossible to do that now and people don't care anymore. So I think that's, that's a fantastic development. There have been some cons. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the deep learning successes have, have increase people's belief in these myths we discussed before, that expertise is opaque compiled experience, that learning is a batch process. Yes, I know uh, deep learning methods do incremental changes to things, but they run through the training sets many, many times. It's effectively batch, <clears throat> um, guided only by the data, uh, and that effective learning requires massive data sets with, with, with supercomputers. Um, <clears throat> And that by itself wouldn't be bad, except that there is so much excitement about this that the deep learning movement has nearly wiped out other approaches, like, like an invasive plant species. And that has, again, reduced the intellectual diversity. And it's not just in research, it's in education. Uh, students are not even being exposed to some of the classic I or, or, or ideas in, in machine learning or even in, in classic AI. And that's really not a good idea. Okay, so where should we go from here? Well, you won't be too surprised to hear some of these things, but maybe the details uh, will. Uh, there are alternatives. In fact, if we go back to the early days of machine learning, we'll find plenty of examples of them. Um, one option is to try and mimic or, or reproduce the aspects of human learning. And that if we do that, then we'll get lots of strong constraints on how to build a com computer learning systems. Uh, in fact, we can use those constraints as sort of as the stations in a computational gauntlet. You have, this is where you have to run through some warriors who are trying to bash your head in. If you make it through, you get to join the club, right? You've succeeded. But if you don't, then you, you don't. Um, many of these are well documented in psychology, but others are so obvious that you probably, you'll probably have trouble finding a citation. But they suggest a very different way to build learning systems uh, that's closer to the original vision for the field. <clears throat> One of the most basic isn't about learning, but about what is learned. It's that, that, it's that what we learn are modular cognitive structures doesn't say what those are. This is a very generic statement, right? It's that expertise consists of discrete mental elements. Uh, it, it, this is proper, obvious in lots of places. If you go back and look at the psychology literature on transfer, you'll see it. it's very obvious there, but it's in lots of other places. There are different candidates for what these structures are. Some people say they're concepts. Some say they're production rules or cases or chunks. Or if you're a behaviorist, there's stimulus response pairs. But even behaviorists would acknowledge there are these modular structures that are required. Um, that is very different from saying that learning produces some single compiled structure, whether it's a deep neural net or a giant decision tree. The second is that, and it's enabled by the first, is that these learned cognitive structures can be composed during performance. So you don't take this giant compiled thing and then just run it. What happens is you, if you've got a particular task or problem you're working on, you find the relevant pieces, relevant structures in memory, and you use those. And you can compose them as necessary. You can chain things together. 
I didn't say it had to be a rule-based system, but you can chain these elements together in some way to produce something you couldn't buy uh, alone. The classic example of this is generative grammars, uh, but rule-based systems are, are other examples. But again, it's not limited to that. Um, and, uh, and it's really different from the use of these large monolithic structures uh, like neural nets or decision trees that you get from statistical induction. Now, look, neural nets and decision trees, you could say, oh, they've got little modular elements in them. They do. There are pieces there. But, but the things are learned en masse. They are, they are used uh, as uh, often as a black box. It is uh, not, uh, it's not like these. Now, again, there is interest in compositional behavior in the deep learning community. Of course there is. People are talking about it. There's been some progress. I tell you, we had, we had all of this decades ago. People have just forgotten about it. The third is that people uh, learn these things in a piecemeal manner with adding one or a few elements at a time, right? They learn one structure and another, and they keep doing that. And that's how you get broad coverage, not all at once, but bit by bit, step by step. They don't learn the complex models uh, all together with all the different pieces, right? Um, now, that doesn't mean you never revisit elements before. Um, uh, you might, in fact, one of my favorite uh, views on things is that uh, that you learn new knowledge structures, new elements, very rapidly. But you 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 do collect data on them. Um, you collect statistics to see whether or not they're doing well, and you, and you gradually forget the ones that are not useful, and you keep the around the ones that are, um, which is certainly more consistent with the original intention of of statistical hypothesis testing. If you think about it, it wasn't invented uh, 100 years ago in order to generate hypotheses. It was invented in order to test and evaluate them. People don't use statistics to generate hypotheses. They use existing knowledge with few experiences to produce new structures. That's my view. We can do that in our, our computer systems too. Another process constraint, it's not about the knowledge elements, but about the training cases, is that learning is an incremental in an online activity, right? So we, we, we are learning one experience at a time, uh, but the data, sorry, we're learning, we're not only learning one knowledge element at a time, but we're doing that based on one experience at a time, right? So again, you may, you may happen to see the same stimulus multiple times, but, but, but but uh, not typically, you can learn a fair amount from, from one exposure to a stimulus, and then you go on to the next one, right? So it's, again, so, sounds like it's related to piecemeal learning. They really are, they, you, they complement each other, but that you can have one without the other. For example, there's some early work on inducing context-free grammars. Um, it was batch, it looked at everything all at once, uh, but it was learning things in a piecemeal way, adding one rule at a time. Uh, Naive Bayes uh, is fully incremental and online, but doesn't uh, isn't isn't uh, actually learning any structures at all. It's just collecting sufficient statistics. All right. Now this this idea of incremental and piecemeal learning um, also supports something else, and it is the use of knowledge to guide the interpretation of new experiences. Okay. Remember, I said earlier, people never learn anything from scratch. They are always learn, learning in the context of existing knowledge. And so, so you, you have some new experience um, and you use your existing knowledge to interpret that. And then you update your knowledge. We add some new things. And, uh, and that, that, that influence of prior knowledge uh, can take different forms. Depends on on what kinds of things you're learning, right? If you're learning a taxonomic hierarchy, uh, then you're going to try and put something, extend the hierarchy somehow. If you're if you're learning uh, a new rule that's made out of, of uh, existing elements, then then you're you're doing some kind of compositional uh, thing. So there's different ways to 
to instantiate this idea, but I think it's clear that knowledge guided learning is not receiving as much attention as it deserves. I would say all human learning is knowledge guided. Uh, there you, again, you do see work on this in the deep learning community with so-called uh, K-shot, few-shot learning, which I, that's an expression that makes no sense to me at all. We used to, used to call it rapid learning, learning from few training cases, but, uh, but they've got their own term for it. So, and that's related to this, um, that we know that humans learn very rapidly um, from small numbers of training cases. Now, that doesn't mean that we acquire everything from a few instances, right? I'm saying that we can learn new cognitive structures from one or a few training cases. And then, of course, if we're trying to learn something else, something new, we'll need something different, right? In a different part of the instance space. This is directly related to the notion of learning rate in psychology. Uh, and you find uh, learning curves in many psychological papers. Um, and we had them, we were publishing them back in the 80s. It was a common thing to find learning curves in machine learning papers. You do see them now too. But again, uh, if you've got millions of training cases, um, it is uh, often people are saying, oh, I don't care about, about uh, how it does on small training sets. Uh, I'm just going to see how well it does uh, with what I have available because they want to get as good results as they can, right? Um, so, so it's a very, very different emphasis. So the, just to summarize then, we've seen that machine learning has obviously had many advances over its 40-year history, but its, its path, path in both research and applications in recent years has been warped by some myths. These are beliefs, unfounded beliefs that expertise must be opaque compiled experience and that learning must be a batch process guided by massive data. I'm not saying it can't be, obviously we have existence proofs of these and, and there are cases where they make sense. So there's nothing wrong with this, okay? But it is not the only way to do it. It's not how people learn. And I would claim that by mindlessly going along with this paradigm and ignoring the alternative, we are really not, uh, well, first of all, we're not being good scientists. Second, we, we are not taking advantage of opportunities that could be very, very important. Um, so if, again, if you look at, at human learning, you find that uh, people acquire modular composable structures. They do it in a piecemeal and incremental way. They, that is aided by knowledge and that lets them learn very effectively from little data. If you go back and look at the early history of machine learning, there are many examples of systems that, that exhibited this kind of behavior. There were many theoretical insights. They were early, as I said, the early application successes were on maybe a few hundred training cases. Um, and we did not have to abandon that. There are still plenty of, plenty of work to be done uh, in that paradigm as well. And I challenge those of you who have not worked in this alternative framework, this human-like learning framework, uh, take a look at it. I challenge you to take this road, this less traveled road, because there are great sites to be seen and new discoveries to be made. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Fat. Um, since I have my mic on, I can clap for you. Thank you. Uh, um, so, um, as expected, uh, no, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, just so people know, um, to show sort of Pat's commitment, it's like close to 3 a.m. Uh, in his time zone right now. It's still here, going strong. <laughs> so, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm sure uh, Pat would be happy to take them. Um, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. I will monitor this. So, please go ahead. If anyone has, I any see some in the chat. I see some in the chat room. No, the chat room is probably me typing stuff. Oh. Those are not questions. Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, good. And and so yes, please go ahead. Uh, I can see. Um, Aaron. Okay, I'm going to edit it, Pat. I'm going to give students a chance. Otherwise, they don't speak up at all. Otherwise, all I'll right. come back to Aaron. Fine. Right. I agree. Any students, anyone uh, or anyone else in the audience who would like to ask questions? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure someone's going to say, oh, you know, the, there's lots of work on deep learning on learning from, from few training cases or on, uh, on uh, compositional behavior. I, my impression is there's some, but it is certainly not, uh, not uh, how most people are spending their time. And, and uh, I think that it doesn't exactly lend itself to these things. I think that most of it is sort of jumping through hoops. Uh, now, you know, uh, yeah, there are, there are connections where they have separate components that do those things. But I'll let, um, I mean, I'm hoping somebody will come and say something. But if they're I, not, I I'm going to go back to Aaron and let him ask his question. Maybe that will give I'm, people I'm, time. To I'm, think I'm, I'm, I'm really a very friendly guy. And I, I promise not to stomp on you too hard if you ask, ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go to Aaron first, uh, since no one is asking. And maybe that will give them a chance to think. Aaron, go ahead. Okay, well, first, thanks very much for a very illuminating survey of a whole lot of things that you were deeply involved in. And I've uh, learned uh, a lot from that. Um, I, I would like to first make a very uh, quick point, which needs discussion, but I'm not going to take it further. I think there's a lot of work going on in theoretical computer science, which can be uh, regarded as contributing to this work um, and uh, we have a large and um, internationally famous group of theoretical computer scientists in this university. I don't know if any of them are uh, actually um, uh, uh, in the audience here, but maybe some of them would like to add some comments later if they, were, if they are. But I, uh, it's loosely related to what's happening in theoretical computer science. So I'd like to make a different point, which is that there's a kind of learning that goes on in mathematics that I don't think uh, fits any of the models that you've been talking about. And it was actually what got me interested in philosophy. I, I first thought I was going to be a mathematician. And then after my math degree, I found people saying things about the nature of mathematics, which I thought was wrong. So I moved into philosophy. And then I uh, started learning about AI and hoped that I'd be able to re-implement these mechanisms in AI. But the examples I'm thinking of are the kinds of things that ancient mathematicians did long before Euclid, I mean, hundreds of years before Pythagoras and so on, in uh, Egypt and China and, and India and various places. And this is uh, making discoveries about things that are impossible or necessarily true by looking at diagrams and understanding some of their structures. And um, I think that is a, a deep and important aspect of human learning, even when it's not happening in um, Aaron. Let me let me let, context. So let me let me make a make, point out that um, I think most researchers would distinguish between learning and discovery. Um, now, I, I I believe they're related. In fact, uh, so the, do I. I did my I did my dissertation on scientific discovery. And it was viewed as part of the machine learning movement back in, in the 80s. So, so I, I think that there are many, many connections. Uh, but most of what, uh, and I, I would agree that the kind of discovery that, uh, that happens in mathematics and science is one of the more distinguishing features between, between humans and say, say uh, rats and pigeons. But, um, but it, uh, there, are, there are many facets of, discovery that are above and beyond what we, we talk about learning, right? So it's, it's, uh, there's a bunch of, of uh, conceptual construction and exploration going on. So I think it's a much, much richer, more challenging kind of problem. I don't deny that it's worth, worth studying. Okay, well, I think it's um, worth, for the, for the people in the audience who, who haven't thought about it, uh, yeah. to, to be aware that that is a, a, a field. And I'll just give one example, uh, which has not to do with humans. I think that when a, a, an orangutan learns how to negotiate motion through trees and later has the sufficient skill to do it while carrying a baby safely, uh, there's a lot of uh, steps that they have to acquire in that process, which sure. would uh, be, fit the description that I think you've just given. Well, I would I would agree that motor skills are far more complex than uh, than um, than most machine learning researchers would acknowledge. They, I'm not talking they, about they motor skills. I'm talking about the decision about what to do next and what you shouldn't do because it's too dangerous and so on. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, in, like assembling in... a nest while you're holding a baby in the tree. Okay. Well, Mohan has worked on manipulation kinds of things. I'll let him answer the question. <laughs> right. No, no. I, I think that, I think that. And there, I think it's there are, related there mathematics. There are, there are endless phenomena that we could go after. And if what you're saying is that we should broaden the scope of problems we go after, um, uh, that we study, I'm with you on that. I think that the AI has become too narrow uh, in over the past uh, few decades. And, and so, but, I, but I, I'll tell you how you get people to work on this. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you gotta, you know, one of the strengths and weaknesses of computer science in general and AI in particular is that you can state uh, tasks in very abstract terms in terms of inputs and outputs. Supervised learning for classification is an example of this, but, uh, but there are plenty of other examples too, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so once you do that, uh, now uh, anyone can, can, can work on that problem because they know they can, you, you can, you can, you can uh, set up uh, uh, training cases and test cases, challenge problems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I would challenge you to formulate your problem in terms of inputs and outputs, so that uh, so that someone could uh, could uh, have a well-defined uh, dissertation topic. I've been doing quite a lot of that recently. Okay. Who's and next? It's harder than it looks. Oh, I I believe you. No, I mean problem as as we both know, um, problem solving is is often e much easier than problem formulation, and finding the right way to formulate a problem so that you can make progress on it is is crucial to scientific advances so um that's why people who you know they're, they're, if you look at machine learning literature maybe there's 10 or 20 classes of problems like this right uh the people who came up with them they were doing the hard work once 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 they've been formulated now you can develop some slightly better algorithm for for, for addressing it that's not nearly as interesting as identifying the problem to begin with so uh so okay any other questions? Uh -huh. We have someone raise their hand. Okay, hi, Yang Chen, go ahead. Please. Uh, one think, minute, Pat, I, I'm gonna, I think I got bits of it. I'm gonna construct a question and have him confirm, okay? Go so ahead. I think he's saying that, do you have any framework that one would uh, use for in the context of human learning that one can incorporate and use in the context of machine learning? Have I got it right, hi, Yang? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, Pat. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, there are there are many of them. And again, uh, if you go back and if you, I mean, you might want to look at my uh, my textbook, Elements of Machine Learning, uh, came out in 1925. Um, I think pretty sure you can get it for cheap somewhere. But uh, but you can look at uh, go to my webpage. You can find lots of lots of papers. Uh, one again, one example. There are there are many. Um, some of the, a lot of the early early work in machine learning that was that was focused on on human behavior uh, was in a framework called production systems. <clears throat> production systems uh, encode knowledge as sets of condition action rules, and they they operate um, in in cycles. If you're familiar with recurrent neural networks, uh, they are sort of a, a, a connectionist version of production systems. But production systems were around for it. And so what happens is you've got a working memory. Uh, you've got a set of rules uh, on each cycle. You, you find which rules match against the contents of working memory, which is usually a set of symbolic structures. Um, you pick a rule to a fire, and that changes memory or changes the world, and you keep going. So in the, uh, in the late 70s, there was a lot of excitement about something called adaptive production systems. <laughs> which were production systems that learned, would acquire new rules and improve performance as a result. And so I did some, some uh, early work on, on uh, learning uh, concepts and uh, search control heuristics and, and, and uh, grammatical knowledge in that framework. So that was one that was very viable and you still find uh, work in that. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the, the SOAR community, SOAR, SOAR is an architecture for uh, for intelligent agents that that is on top of production system framework and it can learn very rapidly and very effectively and so john laird is the uh is the the main developer 
of, of SOAR, you can find stuff uh, on his webpage, L-A-I-R-D. Then uh, the, another example, and there are many others, but another example that I mentioned in passing is this uh, system called Cobweb, which <clears throat> um, is, if you're familiar with decision trees, it's a little bit like a decision tree, except that, uh, that each node um, is a probabilistic summary of, well, the terminal nodes are all training cases that you've seen. And each non-terminal node is a probabilistic summary of everything below it. And what happens at performance time is a new, a new example or experience comes in and you sort it down through the, this probabilistic hierarchy, finding the best, the best uh, branch at each point. And as you do that, you update uh, the, the counts so that you are changing the probabilities. Uh, and occasionally, if you find something that's sufficiently different, you'll create a new branch to the side, or you'll you'll send the tree downward a little bit. So PubWeb was a very, I would say, a very alluring uh, theoretical framework. It learns very rapidly. Uh, there, it is consistent with a number of phenomena about uh, human uh, categorization and category learning. Um, we tried to build a number of things on top of it. Um, it, it, it does tend to be incremental. Uh, and one of the problems is that it can it, it can be sensitive to order effects, uh, but there's there's there were there was a, there was a whole book called uh, called uh, models of incremental concept formation that I co-edited back in the early 90s. There's a number of chapters about cobweb on there, but again you can find you can find uh, I'll I'll put a link in here about to 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 the cobweb papers uh, for those who want to find it. Uh, <laughs> Work in this has not ended. In fact, uh, Chris McLellan, who uh, worked with me at Arizona State years ago, he now has a version of Cobweb uh, for image processing. It's convolutional version. So it's like a convolutional neural net, but it's a convolutional version of Cobweb uh, that learns very learns uh, to recognize uh, uh, patterns and images very, very rapidly. So those are two examples. There are many, but there can be many, many others I could, could give you. There was a big movement um, uh, in the 80s called explanation-based learning that learned very rapidly, uh, but it, 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 and it, it built through heavily on existing knowledge, background knowledge. The problem was that the, most of it assumed that uh, your knowledge was really almost complete. So it wasn't really learning very much. And it assumed that that learning was a deductive process, which I have always thought is crazy. Um, but it did have the sign notion that, that learning involved explaining the experiences that you have and that in terms of existing knowledge. Now explanation doesn't have to be deductive, it can be abductive. And Mohan and I have done some, some work on, on uh, abductive inference for plan recognition. And we have uh, some pretty specific ideas about how to use that to support very rapid learning of, uh, of, of uh, symbolic structures. So I could go on and on and on, but, uh, but I hope I convinced you that there are plenty of examples of these ideas. And if these do not sound like deep neural nets, that's right, they're different. Um, and, and there are many, many techniques out there that are quite different. And if you wanna become a true master of machine learning, you should read about, about many of them so that you get the, that you see just how much how many different ways there are to uh, to to uh, improve performance based on experience? Uh, Pat, you have one more. Uh, this is from Ranjini. Ranjini, go ahead. Uh oh. Hi, Pat. Um, hey. Nice to see you again, and very very nice talk. It's giving me much to think about. Um, I'm I'm going to ask a question which um, is probably more for myself in terms of like thinking through you know, after your talk and so on. But one of the things that you mentioned was um, gaining scientific insights, right? Like, so basically, what do you really learn? I mean, um, and I, I'm going to give an incredibly one dimensional uh, example, which I think is very popular these days when you, you know, when you talk about this compiled learning and stuff. So, you know, you, you do a task and it's, it's, literally um, like, you know, confined to doing like a classification or a regression. And then, you know, you assume you've learned some features, um, you've used some features and you kind of rank them. And then you say, oh, I have learned now that these features matter. And, um, you know, if you reorganize the features or you take this one or you group these together and stuff, then your uh, whatever performance metric is that improves 
um and and you know so and and basically so this is this is this is what i've learned and this is how i kind of gained insight um i was wondering if you could give based on you know your experience like you know you've seen several applications and you know like a, a whole host of things as we saw in this talk um could you give a broader um uh, like an example uh, not not quite an example a broader vision of this gaining science, scientific insights i ask also because um yeah. I work I think, in climate science, um, and you know, I I really want to get down to yeah, go for it. Hold on, I think we may have miscommunicated. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, certainly you can use AI and machine learning to gain insight in a scientific discipline. In fact, I've I've done a lot of work um, in, in many in different areas of science, showing that you can discover or improve scientific models based on on observations you you have. That's not what I was talking about. I was talking about using experimental controlled experiments to understand, to develop a science of machine learning, to understand how different techniques uh, uh, are affected by factors like how much noise there is in the data, how much background knowledge you have, um, how rapidly the environment changes, uh, how many relevant attributes there are. Um, I did put a link earlier, uh, in when Aaron was talking about uh, about uh, uh, formal methods, uh, I, I put in a link to a number of my papers on average case analyses of machine learning. Uh, not because they've gotten any attention in the literature, because there are average case analyses, and if you may may or may not know, um, complexity theorists don't like those. They they tend to to focus on on uh, worst case analyses because they're more general, but but they're worth looking at because they'll show you the kind of of uh, relationships I'm talking about. In the in those papers, we actually uh, showed developed mathematical models that that predicted uh, learning curves as a function of uh, factors like. The amount of noise, the number of relevant and irrelevant attributes, the complexity of the target concept, things like that, and uh, and and so we uh, let me let me let me give you let me give you an example that of something we did understand back in the '90s that may have even been forgotten now. Um, we knew if you think about how decision tree induction works and how neural and how uh, neural nets operate, um, they 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 represent they decision trees. Are very good at at finding hyperplane splits, right? Uh, they're orthogonal to the axis. Uh, so if you had a target concept that that looked like that, where you had sort of hard boundaries and so on, um, then decision tree induction would be a very effective way to 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 learn those. Um, in contrast, if you had a sort of a really strange um, uh, warp shape, then you then using something like a neural network would make more sense. You would probably also need to have have, have more data, but but th that was a general understanding that different representations uh, would support would afford uh, different learning in different conditions depending on the problem you're working. With. Now, of course, the issue is that you really don't know in advance what your data set's going to be like or what the target is. But at least we should be able to understand with uh, synthetic data uh, what's going on and when. When some why why some methods <clears throat> well I mean for example uh, we we know that uh, we know that uh, bagging ensemble methods <clears throat> like random forests reduce variance uh, and can improve uh, accuracy on on new test training cases right uh, do we understand why uh, somewhat but not as much as we could so if we wanted to have a science of machine learning we should be we should be doing studies like that let me make an analogy so. I hear people say, oh, we don't need to do that because machine learning is engineering. <clears throat> well, look at what engineers do. do. How do how do how do civil engineers decide uh, how to build a bridge? They don't just try out different bridge designs and see which ones fall down. They don't do bake-offs, right? They do they do scientific studies of under control conditions that under that let them understand. How factors like the the material, the the length of the span, the the wind, the the <clears throat> the, the you know the the earthquake uh, effects, 
all those things, how they affect the stability of the bridge and whether it's going to fall down. They build models of these things. They, they, they get evidence in favor of them. And then they use those principles to design bridges for, that are good for particular scenarios. That's what we should be doing in machine learning and AI more generally. That is what people are not doing. And that it is, it is, it is it, the, the insight that Herb Simon had when he referred to engineering as the science is the artificial is that good engineering is not very different from, from science. It is prescriptive in the sense that you have some goal you're trying to achieve, but to do it well, you have to have good descriptive models in order to, in order to achieve those goals. That is what we do not have. What we have in machine learning now is, is, uh, is art, not science. Um, and, and people do not know when or why things work. Uh, there are been some insights about fragility of deep learning methods and so on. There's certainly been other examples of that over the years, but nowhere near where we should be doing. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a poverty of the soul almost. Uh, people don't want to be bothered with this. They just want to have these demos and get these great results and say, look, ma, no hands, um, rather than understanding what's going on. That's what I mean by a scientific, a, sci a true science of machine learning. Now, you want to talk about, about applications to, to uh, climate modeling, I'm happy to talk about that. I should probably give another talk about, about uh, computational scientific discovery, and then you can ask your question again. Right, yeah, I was actually going to, no, thank you for clarifying that. And I, uh, I, I appreciate the point you make. And uh, in fact, when you talked about the bridge and you know, engineers constructing bridges, it reminded me of a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where he asks his dad how the bridges were built. And the, his father says, well, they construct this thing and then they let this heavy truck go by. And then if it doesn't break, another heavy one and then so on and on. But yeah, um, uh, that, that's yeah, besides the point. But um, the what I was going to my initial question, though, was uh, uh, was exactly what you said in your last point, which is, you know, um, talking about applications for because we're here in this talk. Could you pop a link or two on what you said that you had done, like applications and how they were used? I just want to get a broader picture of um, how this is done. So in your at your convenience. Uh, uh, Pat, and, if you want, you can also send me an email and I can forward it to people. Yeah, that's fine too. Yeah. So. Sure. Well, Mahan, you can, you can, you can find it. It's uh, just, just go, go to my publications page is a 1995 article with Herb Simon called applications of machine learning and rule. Yeah, and I, I, I think I know that I can, yeah, I, I, yeah. I can do that but, too. Yeah. But again, this is old stuff, right? That's, but, but I'm going to distinguish the success stories in, in applications. That's not, as a result of controlled experiments or anything, right? That's that's uh, based on me talking to people who built these systems. Yes. Finding it, seeing what they did, and and no, seeing I think that. I think uh, Pat, that was what Ranjini was also leading to in the sense that oftentimes when you run a machine learning thing, the notion of understanding is like you know in neural network it's like doing backdrop and other things, but in other classical yeah. machine yeah. learning methods or even modern deep learning ones, which features contributed and by identifying them, I have therefore understood what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean I have a standard <laughs> slide for one of my other talks where I, I show different stages of uh, applied machine learning, and there's a problem formulation stage where you've got some problem and, and, but it's not a machine learning problem. It's a pro real problem you want to solve. You have to recast it in terms of machine learning. Uh, there's a, 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 a feature engineering phase, right? Where you have to figure out what the features are and, and get them right. You have to collect, not only collect the data, but often throw away crappy data or, or clean it up in some way. And then you run your algorithm, but then you're not done because then you've got to take the results and decide what to keep and what to throw out, how to interpret it, and then how to present it or, or deliver it to the users. And, and all of those other things are real challenges. And my impression is, my serious take is, the, 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 the most of the variance the, of what distinguishes successful from unsuccessful applications is whether the developers, it's not what algorithm they use, it's all these other things. A, a, a very simple example uh, from over 20 years ago uh, was a, a group was trying to, uh, to make money off of, off of uh, exchange rates. And so they said, well, okay, we got exchange rates, so we will predict the exchange rates 
using some kind of regression learning method. And it turned out it was, it was very inaccurate and so on. They finally realized they didn't actually care about, about getting the actual exchange rates. They just wanted to know whether this one was gonna be higher than this one. So they turned it, they reformulated it as a classification learning problem and that worked very well for them. Um, that's a really simple example. Um, um, another example is uh, one of the early uh, personalized services. Uh, IBM had a had you know had had their own uh, email system and uh, and they wanted to have it personalized so that so you got a new message it would recommend for you what uh, what uh, folder to put the message in. Well, those guys at uh, TJ Watson uh, tried tried building models about based on that. They had data right because they had lots of messages in folders already. So they didn't have a data acquisition issue, um, but it turned out they could only get like 70% accuracy. Well, if, if you recommend a folder and it's only right seven out of 10 times, you're gonna be fed up and, get, and, and, and move on, right? But then they had this brainstorm. They said, well, wait a minute. What if we showed them the top three? Turned out that was, they had like 97% accuracy there, that, that one of them was, that the right one was in the top three. And that was a reformulation that was fine and effective. Uh, that is the kind of thing you have to do, the games you have to play to be successful at applying machine learning to real world problems. This is not taught in classes. It is not reported in most papers. Uh, it's something that we desperately need more of and, uh, and, and I could give you more examples, but uh, that's enough for now. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, this is exactly sure. what I was going, yeah, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Final questions. Aaron, I'll give a chance. Yeah. We give a chance yeah, to, back to go another, back to sleep. Sorry, who's this? Another question. Who's yeah. this? There's uh, a hand up. Uh, I don't know if it's a hand from before. He was the one who asked the question before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to ask another question. Ah, okay. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pat, um, I suppose you have um, you cooperated with uh, uh, Hubert Simon. I, I suppose you know well about the bounded rationalities. Uh, and the, Pat had no choice to collaborate with Herb, but to collaborate with Herb Simon, and he can explain why, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I went there to work with him. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> but just to be clear, uh, Herb Simon's sense of bounded rationality is not uh, what it has come to mean in the AI literature. Uh, that the kind of work that uh, Stuart Russell and his colleagues have championed is really a perversion of Simon's original ideas. Uh, but go ahead, ask your question. Yeah, yeah my question is, uh, um, yeah, uh, the application of uh, bounded rationalities in artificial intelligence is the uh, bounded optimal. And no. the reason- No, it's not. No, 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 no. sorry, that's, okay, that, go ahead. That's, yeah. That is nonsense. That's what, that's what some people call that bounded rationality. That is not what Simon meant. <laughs> and, uh, and I urge you to go back and read some of Simon's original papers or uh, if you want uh, more recent stuff, uh, Gerd Gigerenzer yeah, in, yeah. in, in uh, Berlin has uh, has been doing continuing to work in the the Simon's tradition on on uh, satisfying and heuristic uh, decision making. Um, it, it, it optimality does not come into it. Optimality is not in many many real world settings is not even is it, well defined. It's true that in you can set things up the way that. Russell and friends have done, and you can call that bounded rationality. Let me tell you the definition of rationality that, that Al Newell proposed uh, uh, back 30 years ago, 40 years ago. He said, an agent is rational <clears throat> if it selects actions that it believes will help it achieve its goals. Now, that seems like a pretty innocuous definition, but notice it says nothing about optimality, nothing at all. You don't have to be optimal to be rational. People aren't optimal. People don't care about being optimal. If you had, if what, what would it even mean to be optimal? You are, would you be satisfied with ten million dollars, or would you insist on having having a hundred billion? I'm sorry. Optimality is is one of the 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 banes of AI, and uh, I'm sorry to to be so passionate about it, but it's caused a lot of damage. Um, now. Now that you know my true feelings on the matter, would you like to rephrase your question? You know, <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yeah. yes, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I re uh, rephrase my question, the question is: um, do, do you think it's promising to you 
to use the framework of boundary rationality to model human human behavior. No, 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 no. Not, 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 not the kind of bound of rationality that has come to dominate AI. It's not what. So, so Simon introduced the phrase bound of rationality. He introduced the term satisficing. It does not have anything to do with optimality. It is antithetical to notions of optimality. Simon was given the Nobel Prize in economics because he argued and provided plenty of evidence for uh, the, the case that humans are not, uh, are not trying to, to, become op to make optimal decisions. They don't care about that. They just care about finding things that are good enough. We have aspiration levels. If we get, if I, I mean, if you, if you get enough of something, you stop. You don't have to get any more. That's fine. Uh, so the, the casting things in terms of optimality, you, you put a bound on it, is, mis, is misguided and misleading and dangerous. So that's, Pat, that's could, I, could I give an example from Gerd's paper? Yes, please. So I think Gerd in one of his recent paper, the one, uh, Gerd Gigerenzer is the one uh, Pat was citing. So in, he says like, you know, when uh, the, the current thinks there are two different versions now, both are in some sense perversions of what uh, uh, Herb Simon initially said. And he said, Herb Simon was a, a economist, like, you know, he was a, a specialization was in economics. And then he wanted to try out his notions of satisfying somewhere. And he said, okay, I'm going to pick AI because it satisfies the requirements, <laughs> not because it's the optimal field for me to try it out. Well, AI didn't exist then. Yeah. Um, no, it's so, again, can you do it? Of course. Um, uh, but think about wh where that takes you. It takes you down the path that, say, the reinforcement learning community went, where they were, became obsessed with optimality or, near, or, or proving that you were nearly optimal uh, or as good as you could get given, with respect to optimality. People don't work that way. No evidence that people work that way. You can, I'm not saying that you never want to have optimal methods. I mean, if you, if you have a linear controller for landing an airplane, I don't object to you using it, right? For very simple tasks, very highly constrained tasks, of course you can develop optimal algorithms and that's a fine thing to do. But remember, <clears throat> the, another, another field that AI was originally quite distinct from was operations research. Operations researchers back in the 50s develop techniques like linear programming and dynamic programming. Um, they were guaranteed to give the optimal solutions under constrained conditions. AI wasn't about that. AI was about going after harder problems for which there were no such guarantees, using methods for which there were no such guarantees, like humans. If I give you, uh, if, I, if, I, uh, if you, I assume that, uh, that you're working on a paper, um, and you want to get it published. Is it going to be the optimal paper? Are you going to calculate how close to optimal it's going to be? Or is your experiments or your system, are you going to, to, to show that you've done the work as well as you could? No, you're going to do good enough and you're going to send it off and hope it gets published. And when, you, uh, when, when it comes time, if it's accepted and you got to get it in by the deadline, are you going to, how many times are you going to read over it to make sure it's, it's perfect? You're not going to. People don't do that. People aren't about optimality. People are about finding solutions that are good enough to satisfy them and trying to build AI systems that behave differently. Well, you can do it, uh, but then you lose access to many of the insights that we have about, about how, how intelligence operates in humans. And I hate to tell you this, but humans are still, I don't care about about AlphaGo or, or whatever the latest breakthrough is in deep learning. People are still the best examples we have of intelligent systems. Um, and we are, if we don't take advantage of all the things we know about human cognition to try and build better AI systems, then we are just missing the boat. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. I'll tell you how this happened. Again, it's related to the fact that AI ended up in the 80s finding computer science as its primary home. Until then, it wasn't because there, were no, there weren't many computer science departments, right? So in the old days, uh, you did a thesis in AI, you were in a psychology or a math or a business school or, what, or, or, or medicine, whatever, and you ended up going somewhere, wherever someone would, would take you. 
but by, by the early 80s, there were more computer science departments. Some of them were beginning to say, oh, well, maybe we should get some of these AI people, but they didn't like them because they weren't real computer scientists. I'm still not viewed as a real computer scientist by some people because I have never taken a course in assembly, sorry, and because I've never taken a course in complexity theory. Um, but I know a lot about psychology and those ideas find their way into the systems I build. And I think that uh, I, I get, gain a lot from that. Um, but what happened was all these people started getting PhDs in computer science departments and they wanted to be like other computer scientists. They wanted to be real computer scientists. They wanted proofs. They had what Freud might've called theorem ending, right? And uh, if you want to be a real computer scientist, you got to be like the complexity theorists because they're the high prestige people. Sorry, that's not, that's not how you do science. They're doing mathematics. Bounded rationality is obsessed with, the math, with, 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 with mathematic results and not with understanding the nature of the mind. That's my view. Um, uh, I am in a minority, but- uh, uh, Pat, I, just, I believe you mean bounded rationality as it's defined these days. That's right. Not Simon's notion of bounded rationality, which was very much not about optimality or or approximations of optimality. It was not about optimality at all. Okay, uh, I think we've gone well above but, but, the time. Thank you for asking the brave question yeah. and giving me a chance to yeah, thank you, it's, thank you, Pat. It's very, it's very satisfying. interesting topic, yes. Well, no, take a look at Giga Renzer's papers because <laughs> he has not only psychological but computational evidence that yeah. obsession with optimality is a bad idea. He also writes very well. If anyone is interested and can't find it, uh, contact me. Not not perfectly, but well. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Aaron, we'll talk about mathematics some other time. Thank you for your question, though. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Okay. Okay. I think I should close this now. Uh, otherwise, Pat will have a very good excuse to say Mohan made me late for all the meetings I had later in the day. So, <laughs> okay. so I'll, I'll let him go now, get some sleep, and then go back to his stuff. Thanks, Thanks very much, Pat. Thanks, Thanks for making time. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.